Good evening, I'm Michelle Leifer. I am the director of the Yuzan Institute for Animal Health Education at the Shoresman Animal Medical Center in New York City. Along with my colleague, Kimberly Young, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event, Cognitive Dysfunction in Senior Pets with Drs. Kate Anderson and Pamela Perry from the Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine. We're thrilled to partner once again with Cornell University for this event, and I'd like to thank Melanie Cordova, Heather Hughes, Kristen Engel-Ross, and Amy Sijin Ling from Cornell for helping us coordinate. This webinar is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for professional veterinary medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you have questions or concerns about your pet's health, it is always best to consult your veterinarian. Tonight's event will be recorded and we'll send out a link tomorrow in case you miss anything or would like to watch it again. We'll be taking questions via chat and the doctors will answer the questions at the end of their presentation and we'll get to as many as possible. I'd like to take a quick moment to let everyone know about an upcoming event on Thursday, May 16th at 6 p.m. We'll host City Hazards and Pets with Dr. Carly Fox from AMC's Emergency and Critical Care Service. You can register for that event on our website, which is amcny.org slash events, and you'll find the link in our newsletter that goes out this evening. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Dr. Kate Anderson is a board certified veterinary behaviorist and graduated from Cornell's vet school in 2008. She has a diverse background, having worked with both large and small animals in private practice and industry. She is currently an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Clinical Sciences at the Duffield Institute for Animal Behavior at Cornell University's College of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Anderson, Anders, Dr. Anderson is also a fear-free certified professional. She lives in Ithaca with her husband and their dog, Ernie. She enjoys cycling, cooking, and baking in her free time. Dr. Pamela Perry earned both her DVM and her PhD from Cornell University. Her graduate research evaluated the effects of enrichment on the behavior, welfare, adoptability, and retention of sheltered dogs. She has lectured extensively on animal behavior and welfare topics and has taught two courses on small animal behavioral medicine for veterinary students at Cornell University. She recently completed her behavior residency at Cornell and is currently a behavior consultant for the Cornell Feline Health Center Community Consultation Service. She lives in central New York with her husband and their five cats and enjoys hiking, gardening, and observing nature in her spare time. So thank you both for making the time to join us tonight to discuss this very important topic. Uh, please welcome Dr. Kate Anderson and Dr. Pamela Perry. Thank you, Michelle. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, now the dreaded sharing of the screen. How did that go? Looks great, got it. Okay, that's always the scariest part. <laughs> okay, hello everybody, welcome, good evening. Um, we're gonna talk about cognitive dysfunction in senior pets tonight. And I wanted to start out by defining what that means. So we use the term senior, um, just like we do with people to describe the older aging pet. Um, and how old a pet is when they're senior seems like a very simple question, but there's actually limited studies looking into this. So there's no specific age that determines senior status. Um, it re with dogs, it really varies with the dog breed and size. Um, so for dogs, smaller breeds tend to live longer on average than large dogs. Um, most recently in 2019, the American Animal Hospital Association um, canine life stage guidelines defined senior as the last 25% of a pet's life. And then the American Association of Feline Practitioners um, senior care guidelines defined cats over 10 as senior, but it, it really can vary sometimes. So one thing that I find interesting is that um, you know, we don't think often about, or we sometimes forget about our senior pets. And um, as veterinarians, I think it's always important to know who we're treating and who we're trying to take care of. So, you know, I was curious to look up how many senior pets are there in the United States, and it's it's quite a large number. So, and, and unfortunately, these statistics are not always perfect. There's a lot of surveys that go out, so it's impossible to get a perfect answer. We don't do a census, but um, 
the AHA did a survey in 2023 that found that 44% of the dog and cat population in the United States um, is senior. And then there was another survey by Global Pets that found that um, cat owning households in the US have senior that have senior cats is about 52%. So it's really almost half the population of animals in the US, which is quite amazing. And I think part of the reason for this is that, you know, the senior population is on the rise because as with humans, modern medicine has increased the lifespan across many species, including pets. Um, so I found this chart, which I hope doesn't look too scary, but it basically shows, um, it was a study by Montoya in 2023, and it found an increase in average life expectancy across every type of pet from small breed dogs, large breed dogs, mixed breed cats. Um, obviously, there's variation in what the average is for each of those, but you can see from 2013 to 2019, um, everything was trending upwards. Um, I found another study, um, interestingly, by O'Neill in the UK. Um, it, this study, I think the median lifespan for cats was somewhere around 11-ish, um, but there was another study in the UK that found the average median lifespan for cats was 14 years old. Interestingly, in that study, um, mixed breed cats had a higher average lifespan than purebred cats. In, in this study, the one that's on the graph, they found the opposite. Mixed breed cats actually um, were lower than purebred cats. But the study in the UK did note that there was like a huge amount of variation. So that may be a little misleading when you're only looking at the average. Okay. And then Pam's going to, Dr. Perry is going to talk about what, what cognitive dysfunction syndrome is. Good evening. And again, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, first of all, I apologize for my voice quality. I am uh, recovering from a bout of the flu. And uh, secondly, I am doing this from home and I own five cats who um, I hope will not misbehave during this, but I'll just give you that little red flag of a warning because as we know, pets are, are very unpredictable. Um, so what is cognitive dysfunction syndrome? It is a, a degenerative condition of the brain in aging dogs and cats. And it, um, causes a progressive decline in cognitive functioning, which by that I mean not just learning and memory, but also perception and awareness of the environment and of their surroundings. And as a result, we see behavioral changes in these animals that, although um, can look like behavior changes that we see with some disease processes, physical diseases, these usually, when we're diagnosing cognitive dysfunction syndrome, these are changes that are not attributed to underlying medical conditions. So, and again, I don't want to get too technical here, but um, cognitive dysfunction syndrome is similar to Alzheimer's disease in people. And one of the, the hallmarks of it is a type of protein called beta amyloid that develops plaques that build up in the brain. And the bottom picture on the right shows these little blue plaques. And as they accumulate, they interfere with the um, nerve cells ability to communicate and function properly so that um, signals are not getting passed along in the brain functioning therefore is impaired. They also get damaged uh, by reduced blood flow and um, a buildup of, of what we call free radicals, which are basically the byproducts of energy production that occurs in the brain. And we get structural changes and loss of nerve cells that then result in the behavioral changes. Uh, the top pictures show a MRI image of a young dog versus an old dog. And without going again into too much detail, the the dark little areas on the top uh, are ventricles where there is spinal fluid that flows throughout the brain. So in the old dog, you see those spaces are larger and therefore in order for them to be larger because the, the skull does not expand, 
that means there is less brain tissue around them. So the brain is actually shrinking. And the H with a white arrow showing um, a part of the brain called the hippocampus that's involved in memory storage. And that is actually much smaller in the old dog versus the young dog. So a an, an kind of an easier way to look at it is if our brain is like a walnut um, and we crack it open, we see a nice healthy walnut on the left and some nice grooves and valleys and lumps and bumps and it, you know, the color looks good and it fills up most of that space in there. So that is indicative of a healthy walnut. But with cognitive dysfunction syndrome, because we're losing neurons and um, the brain is actually shrinking, then the old dried up picture of the walnut on the right is, hopefully our brains don't look quite that badly, but um, that is kind of a, a nice analogy of what happens. The nerve cells die and the brain actually will, will shrink in mass. So how common is cognitive dysfunction syndrome? Well, it's one, it is, it can be difficult to diagnose because a lot of the behavioral signs mimic those we see with other diseases. But studies have reported that uh, in dogs from the age of 11 to 12, 28% were reported to show at least one behavioral sign that was consistent with cognitive dysfunction syndrome. And when you looked at dogs 15 to 16 years of age, then that number increased to 68%, showing at least one sign. With cats, the 11 to 14 year olds, again, 28% were um, reported to have at least one behavioral sign of cognitive dysfunction, but cats 15 years and older, 50% of them were showing at least one behavioral sign that was indicative of the disease. So I think an important question to ask is, you know, which pets are at risk? How do I prevent this from happening? Or why is this happening to my pet and not another pet? And, and that's a really difficult question to answer. Um, there has been a lot of research looking at different factors, such as um, the sex of the animal, whether or not they're spayed or neutered, the size of the animal, large versus small versus medium, you know, things in the environment, um, as well as nutrition. Um, unfortunately, the only primary risk factor that has been identified out of all of those things is age. So getting older, unfortunately, increases your risk. Um, there was one study that was done um, by Katina, I think that's right, um, that did find increased risk, almost three times uh, more risk for dogs who ate low quality commercial diets and table scraps. So um, there's probably more to that story, but um, but certainly diet might be something to um, think about in terms of risk factors. And we know with people, there are genetic risk factors and different physiologic things that can contribute to it as well. And we have to think that's true with our pets, but we don't we don't have enough research at this time to know for sure. As we said before, you know, many of the um, clinical signs that we'll review with cognitive dysfunction um, can look like other physical diseases. And so it's really important to um, bring your pet in for a physical exam if there's any change in their behavior. So for example, we'll talk about, you know, dogs having urinary accidents in the house. Well, rather than panicking that it might be something like cognitive dysfunction, it's, it's better to get a diagnosis and find out that it might be something very treatable, like an infection or something else. Um, and, and obviously, too, you wouldn't have much luck treating cognitive dysfunction if it was actually due to another problem. Um, but it can be complicated, and we'll talk a little bit more about how to diagnose it. So the diagnosis of cognitive dysfunction syndrome in both dogs and cats um, is based right now on the recognition of any potential behavioral signs, while also excluding other medical conditions that can mimic or complicate cognitive dysfunction. 
And that can be difficult because unfortunately, with increasing age, there's an increased likelihood of other ongoing medical issues. So sometimes that can be really challenging to sort out. Um, it's also important to note that some drug side effects can also confuse the diagnosis. And, and often, just like with people, we're more likely to be on medication as we get older, not always, hopefully. But for example, steroids can increase drinking, changes, change your appetite, cause panting, cause restless behavior, nervousness, um, irritable aggression, um, food guarding, um, and increased barking. So those could be confused for cognitive changes. As it stands right now, there's no definitive test for cognitive dys dysfunction syndrome. Um, clinically, we currently use a screening questionnaire to identify pets that might be at risk or identify changes over time. Um, in the laboratory setting, as is shown with the picture of the cat here that's um, eating some food, um, we can use memory tasks to track changes in cognitive function in aging animals. But this isn't really practical as a true diagnostic test, especially for um, pet animals. And then imaging can also be helpful. So an MRI, um, advanced imaging like, like shown here, could be helpful in identifying changes in the brain that might be related to cognitive dysfunction like, like um, Dr. Perry was talking about. Um, it can also be helpful in ruling out other causes of symptoms. So um, something in the brain might mimic cognitive dysfunction that we can actually see and diagnose like a tumor or a stroke. Um, Unfortunately, many of the changes documented in the brain related to Alzheimer's in people have yet to be studied in dogs and cats. So we don't have a perfect way to look at the size of the hippocampus or the size of the ventricles and say that it's definitively um, cognitive dysfunction. Um, I'm hopeful someday that there'll also be, I'm sure a lot of people are, some something called novel biomarkers we can use. These are biological molecules found in blood and other fluids in the body or tissues. And they can be little signposts for normal or abnormal processes or a condition or a disease. So um, that might help with earlier detection and let us track like progression of the disease. Um, and that's really important because a lot of studies have shown that um, memory impairment or the actual disease process can happen well before there's obvious behavioral changes. So often, as with people, um, when we start to notice that something is going on, it's often very advanced at that point. So um, if you go to your vet, and I listed this on the other slide, sorry, I forgot to go through it, but some things that they um, might be thinking about in terms of other diseases that they want to rule out is neurologic disease. So something going on in your pet's brain, um, some forms of seizures, um, sensory deficits, problems with vision, hearing, um, smell, um, any metabolic or endocrine diseases like thyroid disease, adrenal disease, diabetes, um, anything that causes pain such as arthritis, um, back pain, neuropathic pain, and then any sort of gastrointestinal disease um, and other organ systems. Those are those are less common, but they can happen as well. Another challenge of cognitive dysfunction is that um, behavior changes because they're mild at first, they can often be confused or attributed to just getting older. Um, I'm, I'm very much um, adamant to my clients and, and for my own pet that, you know, age is not a disease. Things change as we get older, but some changes aren't normal, but there are some that we do see commonly. And, and that's a fact of life that we all have to have to have to deal with. Um, so there might be graying of the coat and the muzzle. Um, dogs that are older have changes in their in how they sleep. They they sleep more frequently, but they, not as long. So they have shorter bouts of sleep. Um, and they can have impairments in regulating their body temperature. They can be more sensitive to things, not um, their blood flow might be impaired. Um, stress, as we know, you know, older humans, if you undergo some kind of stress or injury, it can take much longer to recover when you're young. So all of these things um, are something we have to get our animals through as they age, but we also want to be aware that they can confuse our ability to identify cognitive dysfunction. So what exactly are the clinical signs and of cognitive dysfunction? And I'm going to talk specifically about dogs, and Dr. Perry will then um, go a little more into some things that are different about cats. Um, so unfortunately, things can sort of happen um, 
either gradually or suddenly. Um, and so that can be a little frustrating because we can't exactly just always know what to expect. Um, and generally behavioral changes can be seen in activity level, sleep, appetite, social interactions, um, ability to get through space, um, forgetting things that they once knew. Um, and I'll go through them one by one and talk a little bit more about them in detail. But the most common reported sign in dogs are alterations in social interactions and a break in house training. Um, so having urinary or, or fecal accidents in the house. So disorientation, oh, and I'm sorry, I, I forgot to say. So we we sometimes use an acronym to help us remember these, which is DISHA, which um, usually I still have to go through the list, but at least you can kind of have that in your brain if you're trying to remember like what to think about for this disease and kind of go through them step by step. So, um, oops, it's not going forward now. So D is for disorientation. Um, and that's difficulty navigating the environment. They may go, um, I think a really common sign that a lot of people report is going to the wrong, or you know, something that people definitely notice is a dog that stands waiting at the door on the doorknob side suddenly goes to the wrong side of the door and kind of gets, um, waits there instead. Um, they can get kind of stuck under tables or corners. They might stare at the walls or the ceiling. They might not recognize family members. Um, they might get lost at home or in the yard or places where they've, you know, they're definitely familiar with the environment. They might be less responsive to sights or sounds. And these changes are are definitely um, similar to other diseases of the brain and sensory deficits. So it's important to rule those out as well. And then getting stuck or um, having trouble can also point to mobility issues, arthritis, and, and other things like that. So it's important to put together the whole picture. I for social interactions can also sort of vary. Some pets may become fearful or withdrawn. Um, some may actually show aggression towards other family members or animals when they previously had a very stable relationship. They may have less interest in interacting with people. Again, all of these things could be mimicked by pain and sensory deficits. It's hard to be friendly when you don't feel well or you ache. Um, it can make you irritable or aggressive. Um, and so that's another thing to try to sort out as you're identifying these things going on with your pet. Uh, Sleep-wake cycle. Again, um, even though do older dogs have alterations in how much they sleep um, and how, you know, more frequently, but shorter bouts, um, dogs with cognitive decline can sort of flip-flop and have a reverse of their day-night schedule. So they can sleep less at night and more during the day. And at night, they could be restless, pacing, panting. Um, they might also bark or whine or vocalize more at night. And I will say in general practice, this was a common one that I saw as a presentation because I think obviously you pay attention to your pet and you want the best for them, but if you're not getting sleep, that that becomes more a more urgent concern, which is which is completely normal and, and understandable. Um, but it can be really hard not to get a good night's sleep as your pet's keeping you up. House soiling, um, also kind of they in this category, H for house soiling, they kind of include learning and memory as well. And obviously there's some overlap in these categories, but this is another important one for ruling out medical causes because there's hundreds of diseases that can cause increased thirst and urination like diabetes and many other things. Um, but you might notice that it's both urine and feces. Um, a, the pet might decrease the amount of signaling they give to go outside or they used to let you know, um, or they might forget to go when they're outside. So they might go outside for a while, come back in and then eliminate in the house. And so that's where they kind of put learning and memory with this as well, because it's it's sort of part of being more easily distracted or having less focus. And then activity changes, um, decreased exploration, play, interactions with family members or other pets. Um, so these are things sometimes we can attribute to, you know, getting older, calmer than not being a puppy anymore. Um, but it's important to also make note of, you know, the level that that's changing and how severe it is. Um, some pets can have increased activity, so more pacing, more wandering. Um, they may display repetitive behaviors, circling, chewing, licking. Um, stargazing is kind of looking up in the sky. 
Um, those kinds of behaviors are really important to differentiate from some types of neurologic disease. And also um, the licking, um, what's been reported is like licking owners or objects that can also be a sign of upper GI, stomach ulcers, um, stomach disease. So those are all important things to try to figure out um, because it could be very different um, based on what's actually causing it and the signs that you're seeing. And then the last A is for anxiety. And as a veterinary behaviorist, I think the pets that I see with cognitive dysfunction or suspected cognitive dysfunction fall in this category most often um, because I treat anxiety every day, um, whereas some of the other clinical signs might be seen more by internal medicine, if it's house soiling or neurology, if it's circling. Um, and it's always challenging to figure out if the anxiety is a pre-existing problem that suddenly escalated, if it's related to aging. I think sometimes dogs that can't hear um, when have trouble with noises when they suddenly can hear. Um, but we know that cognitive dysfunction can contribute to anxiety. So they might suddenly develop more anxiety when separated from familiar people. They might be more fearful of things in the past that they've encountered that were not an issue for them um, or anything new um, and, and other things like that. So um, it's important to, to notice that it's just not them being difficult about something. There might actually be a reason that this anxiety has emerged at that point in their life. Okay. Um, so we have DISHA for dogs, uh, which Dr. Anderson just explained very nicely. And for cats, however, the behavioral presentation is a bit different. So one acronym that's been proposed is uh, Vish Doll, and essentially separating out learning and memory from uh, the DISHA version, but putting more emphasis on vocalization, which is a uh, common sign in cats. So in uh, one study surveying owners, cats 11 years and older, almost 60% of them were reported to vocalize excessively, especially during the night. And indeed, in um, the few studies that there have been done on this disorder in kitties, the one of the most common complaints is excessive vocalization. And uh, so for those of you who are blessed to have very vocal kitties, it's something to look forward to because they do indeed become very vocal and uh, usually quite loudly. And um, usually when you are sound asleep during the night, as I have been um, able to experience firsthand. Cats also are reported to become more affectionate and purr quite a bit more. So even though this can be a clinical sign of cognitive dysfunction syndrome, it's not one that typically bothers family members. So it's not one that clients will report to veterinarians because they like it. They like it, the fact that cats seek out their attention and are more affectionate. But if you're seeing a change in these behaviors, again, it is always best to at least inform your primary care veterinarian about them so that you can monitor, monitor them over time and observe for other behavioral changes and um, in order to provide treatment early in the disease. Other common behavior changes that we see in cats include house soiling, forgetting either where the urine box, yeah, the litter box is, or um, a lot of times that also can be accessibility issues of the cats not able to navigate the house properly and find the litter box, then uh, that certainly can contribute to it. And disorientation, which often is in the form of this aimless wandering, which also, again, is often um, in conjunction with the excessive vocalization. Other symptoms that you may see, and uh, again, all of these can be to any of the myriad of, of medical reasons that Dr. Anderson discussed, but some of these cats will have a decrease in their hygiene and their grooming habits. Appetites change. They're often decreased 
and this may be in part due to a decreased sense of smell um, and or they may be just unresponsive to normal stimuli. So noises that would alert them before or sights that might um, interest them, they no longer either are able to perceive or just don't seem aware of them or process that stimuli as efficiently as they did prior. So based on all this, what do we do? to treat cognitive dysfunction. It is a progressive disease. So the treatment and management will be lifelong and we are not able to cure the disease, but we certainly can help slow down the progression and improve the, the cat or dog's quality of life. But it's also important to treat any concurrent diseases because obviously they will impact the quality of life and the, the animal's ability to respond to treatment specifically for the behavioral issues. So one of the areas that's received uh, quite a bit of research and attention is nutritional support. There are two diets, prescription diets that are available for dogs and um, Perhaps someday we'll have these for cats as well, but currently these are for dogs. The Hills BD diet, which has been out on the market for quite a long time, and uh, the Purina NeuroCare diet. And both of these diets are formulated with antioxidants and um, omega-3 fatty acids and, and all the nutrient blends that are supposed to um, protect the brain against the effects of aging. So they they counteract a lot of the damage that's being done and they um, offer support to not just the brain, but the immune system and other bodily functions. If a dog is unable to take these diets because of health issues or uh, tolerance uh, from the richness of the diet, or they just do not like them, then we can offer supplements that essentially achieve the same result. We're trying to, again, counteract the oxidative damage from those free radicals that, that damage the neurons, again, the byproducts of energy metabolism, as well as provide some um, antioxidants and support for some of the functions of the uh, cells in the brain. So some of the supplements available are Senolife and Activate and SAMe. However, it's important, first of all, to consult with your primary care veterinarian before putting an animal on any of these supplements because they can interact with other medications that the pet may be on. But also, the ones that are specifically formulated for dogs should only be given to dogs because in, in some cases they may contain ingredients that are toxic to cats. And we certainly do not want to give human supplements or medications or um, something that's specific for humans to animals without first consulting with a veterinarian to make sure that they are safe to use because some of them do contain levels of um, nutrients or ingredients that may be toxic to animals that we can tolerate, but they cannot. So again, uh, we can use medications either specifically for cognitive dysfunction syndrome. There is one that is FDA approved called selegiline. Um, we often use other medications to treat specific clinical signs. So that is something that needs to be addressed on an individual case basis with your primary care veterinarian and making sure that Again, other diseases are well managed and treated properly. Pain management should always be addressed, and we often overlook the impact that in the past that pain um, had on behavior. But now that we're more aware of the subtleties of changes in an animal's behavior due to underlying disease and discomfort and pain, then uh, we are getting better at detecting pain and also treating it. Animals are very, very good at hiding pain and other 
illness. So it's important to um, make sure that we are being proactive in treating it. So in terms of more holistic or natural treatments that we can try, there are um, some supplements that are for anxiety, such as soliquin, anzatine, and zilkine that have research backing their use for reducing anxiety in dogs and cats. Uh, melatonin can sometimes be used to help with uh, these sleep-wake cycle disruptions that a lot of these animals uh, have. So trying to promote a more natural sleeping um, environment and having them sleep during the night rather than being awake all night and then sleeping during the day. Again, joint supplements, a lot of these older animals do have arthritic joints. So um, we can give them some joint supplements, anti-inflammatories, and there is a probiotic put out by Karina called Calming Care that is formulated to affect the gut microbiome, the, the bacteria that are that's in the gut to help reduce anxiety and in dogs as well as in cats. Uh, pheromones are also another option to try. Some of these older animals respond well to the pheromone products that are available in promoting an, a more secure calming effect on them. Otherwise, you know, again, these are geriatric animals. So they're going to have difficulties for a myriad of reasons, not just cognitive dysfunction, but also physical. So making sure that we provide the proper accommodations so that the burden on them and therefore the burden on us is not so great. So offering dogs more opportunities to eliminate outside, uh, Giving them pee pads or a doggy litter box is another option. They do make doggy diapers or belly bands to um, help con contain some of the mess that some of these poor animals make. And for cats, adding litter boxes, giving them an easier access litter box that has a low front or low side so that they don't have to step over a very high edge just to get into the box and putting them in locations that are convenient and easy to get to. These are geriatric animals and they can no longer navigate the environment as well as they could, whether it be to cognitive issues or to physical issues. So trying to make it easier for them will benefit everybody. Uh, Non-slip surfaces are important because for an animal that's disoriented and doing a lot of aimless wandering and pacing, then slipping and falling is certainly not going to improve things. It will just make them more anxious, could lead to injury, and may make them feel more disoriented. So non-slip surfaces are really helpful, whether it be on the um, rugs that you have on the floor that are more secure, putting a yoga mat down on a floor surface next to the food dish so the animal doesn't slip every time they try to eat or drink, Ramps and stairs um, are really good options for improving their access to areas. Other accommodations, providing night lights is important. Again, many of these animals are losing their vision. They don't see as well as they used to, and, and no one can see in total darkness. So providing night lights so they can navigate the environment, especially during the night, is helpful. Heated beds, I find, are really useful for any geriatric patient. Some of my younger cats as well seem to really enjoy them. And especially if they are arthritic or have any um, muscle aches or pains, they seem to find a lot of benefit from having a, a heated bed. Raising the food and water dishes can also help with, with some animals. Some prefer having them on the ground. So again, it's an individual preference, but that may be another option to try. And certainly setting the animal up to succeed. If they're wandering around and they're at risk of, of falling down a set of stairs, or if it's an animal that's becoming more irritable and you have children in the house, then perhaps gating off those sections of the house to keep the animals safe and as well as any children. 
um, from encountering the animal and, and causing more irritability or uh, aggression or anything like that. A calm environment certainly is best. These animals are having problems navigating. They're having problems being aware and perceiving properly and becoming disoriented. So they certainly will benefit from a calm environment. And I think it's it's really important for us to take time out to spend with these animals and uh, have that bonding time so that we we all get the benefits from that interaction and giving them the security that they get from being with owners. This is a, another option which I like for dogs who do the have difficulty navigating or um, are disoriented and may and may be pacing or wandering around is having a little baby bumper bed and that way they've got some nice cushioned surroundings that if they do fall into it or bump into it they're not going to harm themselves and although we like to use enrichment with our animals, it's also important to avoid any drastic changes. So again, it's stressing a calm environment and keeping changes to a minimum. So if you're thinking of, of redoing the house, perhaps this is not the best time to do it, or if you are going to do it, do one small section at a time. Don't do a major overhaul of the layout because it will be, more disorienting to the animal. If they ha are having visual problems, then they won't be able to navigate or find resources that they could otherwise. Animals are very good at navigating even if they lose vision, but if we change things around too much, especially in an animal that's having a decline in their ability to perceive and um, to think, then that can make a lot of stress and a lot of problems for that animal. And along the same lines is keeping a daily routine is very important. Animals thrive on consistency and, and all of us know how much our animals like a routine and like consistency. So again, trying to keep their days as, as routine as possible. And I often, um, stress that even if you can't keep a strict schedule, for instance, having dinner at 6 p.m. every evening, because life is just not that way. We, we have things that occur that may make it later or earlier in the evening. If that occurs, then I like to try to make um, the sequence of, of events around the more uh, mundane daily occurrences the same. So for instance, if you uh, have dinner and then you do your dishes and then you sit down with your cat on the on the couch every evening, if you do it in that that order, that sequence, they know that dinner dishes means couch time. So if dinner's at six versus eight p.m., that's okay as long as you keep the sequence of events the same. So that creates some consistency around a more inconsistent schedule. So it allows you to get away with a little bit of variation in the um, actual timing of events. And I have found that to actually one of my cats taught me this lesson because um, he, he joined me briefly earlier, but he knows that in the evening after I have dinner and do the dishes that he gets what we call a goose patrol. His name's Goose. I carry him outside. We step out the door, we listen, we look, we sniff for two minutes and come back inside. So he will, as soon as he sees me doing the dishes after dinner every night, he'll be at the front door waiting for his little goose patrol. Um, and he will not tease for it unless I've done X and Y because he knows that's when he gets his time with me. So again, it's important to try to keep as much consistency as we can, even if the um, uh, timing is not the same. So enrichment, again, it's on the principle of, of use it or lose it, but too much change can be stressful. So we have to do this gradually, and we don't want to just throw in all this 
enrichment all at once. So one way to do it is food dispensing toys or puzzles. Make the animals sniff around and play with these devices to get some of their food or treats out. Uh, give the animals time outdoors, whether it's to, to sniff and walk around the yard or just to lie in the sun, whatever they seem to enjoy. Just that sensory stimulation can be very enriching. Nose work for dogs. Um, some cats enjoy it too, but certainly the snuffle mat, which is in the bottom uh, picture on the left side, um, is a fabric-like mat that you can hide treats and food in. So the dog gets to sniff around to find little little uh, tidbits of goodies in there. And that also can be a form of enrichment and just working on some basic, um, you know, simple obedience training, whether it's a sit, a shake, a down, uh, just to reinforce some behaviors and again, give you a time to stimulate that animal mentally. And cats certainly can be trained as well, believe it or not. Um, so I've taught, couple of my cats to high five. They can be mat trained. So you can do some training with them as well. And there was a, a study that um, a couple of years ago that a colleague performed and they had owners of geriatric dogs participate. One group participated in um, these weekly 50 minute dog classes there for four weeks. And that involved educating the owners on common behavior issues for older pets and also doing some reward-based training such as um, hand targeting and some enrichment exercises such as using some food puzzles and food toys. So they, you know, for 50 minutes a week, for four weeks, they did this. And then they filled out a uh, questionnaire about the dog's behavior at three months, six months, and 12 months. And for the dogs who did not participate in the classes, they saw a progression of the signs of cognitive dysfunction increase from three to 12 months. But dogs who were in the class, who had whose owners were uh, went through the educational program, as well as doing the enrichment and training sessions, their signs of cognitive dysfunction did not change, meaning they did not progress. They didn't get worse from three to 12 months. So it seemed to have a bit of a protective effect against the progression of these signs. So in, in uh, trying to sum this up, the um, <laughs> here's problem child number one, uh, Thomas. Um, it's important, you know, again, as Dr. Anderson said, aging is not a disease. So we need to be proactive and try to treat this early or better yet to do some of these uh, recommendations before we can detect any behavioral changes. Uh, you know, the, the use it or lose it principle again. And, um, sorry. <laughs> so one study showed that just under 2% of animals were diagnosed with um, cognitive dysfunction syndrome, even though the prevalence in that study was uh, over 14%. So we, we need to diagnose it better, but we also need owners to report it to us and we need to ask about it in return because a lot of these behavioral changes are very subtle and they can be often attributed to either other medical conditions or to aging, but we wanna make sure that we're not uh, seeing early signs of cognitive dysfunction syndrome, which is itself a, a disease process. So one of the ways to do that is with a screening uh, questionnaire. This is one that is put out by Karina, but there are several available where every year you fill out one of these forms and rate your dog's behavior in these different behavioral categories on a scale of zero to three, with three being the most severe. And then you get a total score at the end and you can assess over time whether or not your animal is um, progressing in one of these signs. And if so, then that's when we need to start to implement more 
aggressive treatment for that area. So there is help and certainly um, your, your regular veterinarian is an excellent place to start. And if they do indeed suspect that your dog or cat has cognitive dysfunction syndrome, um, then you also have the option of consulting with a veterinary behaviorist. But I, I also wanna emphasize that it's really important for everyone to be compassionate and have patience for these animals because they are not always aware of their environment. They don't perceive as well. Their learning and memory is declining and a lot of them become disoriented. So the behavioral changes we see are certainly not out of um, any malice or any spitefulness on the animal's part, but because of the pathology that's occurring inside their brains. Uh, there's a nice book out there called Remember Me, written um, uh, by someone who had a dog with co canine cognitive dysfunction and Eileen Anderson. And she has a nice video. Uh, it's just a four minute video with a link that's uh, posted there and demonstrating some of the signs that her dog demonstrated as um, he went through some of these behavioral changes. And I believe that is all we have for now. So we'll open it up to questions. And um, I, again, want to thank everybody. So we'll see what we have for questions. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. This was such a wonderful, comprehensive presentation. And just to remind everyone, we will post this tomorrow to YouTube. So if you missed anything, don't, don't worry. Um, we will send out the link to everyone who registered. Um, um, Dr. Anderson, if you want to unshare the screen and then we can take some questions. Um, okay, we have some a bunch of, of good questions. Um, first, we have, um, okay, sorry, hold on, let's back to it. Met many people saying thank you. Um, okay, um, what is the best way to support a, um, a dog with CDS who's 14 and three quarters when they have to move to a new home? You, uh, I can I can answer that if you want. Um, I I think unfortunately, yeah, it's obviously necessary to to continue with your life and do the best you can in that situation. Um, I can also share a nice. Um, there's a two part article on pet psychology today. I think on moving with your pet, um, that can give some general guidelines. But I think um, trying to keep things as consistent as possible and like removing your pet from, from the environment when all the packing and moving is going on and then trying to set up sort of familiar items from the old home in the new home. Um, and then also, you know, that might be a time when you want to see if um, some medications may help with the stress of that as well. Something maybe your pet's not on long term, but um, something you can try before the move to help deal with that stress. But um, I'll share the link with Michelle. The article is really good on moving with your pet. Um, I think that might be helpful, more helpful than all the things that I can't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> Great. Okay. We'll, we'll send, be sure to send that out tomorrow. Um, you have a question about um, getting a younger dog, a, a puppy. Um, will that a, help a dog with cognitive dysfunction syndrome? Is that a good idea? <laughs> Probably not the best time to get um, a young puppy or kitten. It, it's these animals are are having difficulties with perceiving and uh, a lot of times they don't recognize owners um and a younger animal's energy although we think you know it might perk them up often it's it can backfire so we don't want to add stress to that animal or or create any conflict um in an animal that's having difficulty navigating their environment and becoming disoriented so, um, yeah, we typically recommend to wait as much as we all like having young ones around us. It does seem to um, make us feel a lot happier and more vibrant. It's not necessarily the case when we're talking about our senior pets. And um, one other comment to go with a previous question that I often recommend if you're going to make a move with um, a pet and which is you know, sometimes just unavoidable, 
then sometimes it helps to when you get to the new places to to confine them to a smaller section of the house so that they have less area to um, feel new to them. And that way they can become familiar with a smaller part of the house and then gradually increase the uh, access to other areas as they become more comfortable in that core living area. Okay, great. Um, do you have any advice for monitoring cognitive function in newly adopted senior pets? I recently adopted a 16 year old cat, which is amazing to do that. And I don't feel I have a good baseline for her behavior because of the huge adjustment. Yeah, that, I mean, it, it's, it's difficult if you don't know the, the history beforehand, but certainly again, these cognitive screening um, questionnaires are, are helpful and knowing, uh, you know, going through the, what for cats, the Vish doll. So finding a questionnaire that, that rates it on a scale of zero to three, um, seeing if, if the animal is showing signs in any of those categories um, in terms of disorientation, excessive vocalization. Um, and then I would, I would repeat it like every two or three months to see if things are progressing. It's much more difficult when the animal's already geriatric and you don't know if this is just a normal cat, the, this cat's been vocal its entire life, um, or if this is a, a new sign. So I would start with getting a baseline now and then just reassessing every couple of months. Okay, great. Okay, so this is a hard question, but I know one that probably many people are wondering. Um, how long can a dog with moderate cognitive dysfunction keep going? Um, when do you consider putting the dog down? Um, I can feel it well. You can. You want me to start and you can add, Dr. Perry? No, um, you can. I think it's it's hard it's hard to predict how you know the how quickly things will progress and I think it's um, a very individual decision to to go through with your veterinarian in terms of what constitutes quality of life for your pet and the specific signs that they're manifesting. It is always harder when it's you know um, not so much a terminal illness that's as physically affecting them, um, just like with people with Alzheimer's. But I do think sometimes we can um be be kinder in terms of making be being more proactive depending on on other diseases that they're struggling with mobility other things so it's kind of putting to get everything together and deciding what is best for that pet okay dr perry did you want to add it add to that no I, I i agree with that it, okay it's, it's so hard I, to i know to put a blanket statement out there but i think just you know, ensuring the quality of life of the animal um, and knowing when that is starting to decline, that that's when we really should revisit the issue of, you know, it, when would euthanasia be the best option if we are no longer seeing improvement and um, the animal is showing more severe signs of disorientation or um, failing and, and causing harm to itself or, or something along those lines but yeah it, it's never an easy decision i think it's even more difficult when it's a behavioral reason when we have to consider euthanasia absolutely absolutely um okay my dog's cognitive dysfunction is much worse in the winter compared to the summer is there an explanation why i would i have never heard that but i would imagine <laughs> it's maybe due to some of the things we talked about in terms of like i mean obviously other disorders might be exacerbated by the cold, like arthritis and not, you know, regulating their temperature as well. But I don't think I've ever heard of a seasonal pattern to it, mm -hmm. Dr. Perry. Yeah, I know I haven't. Um, it may be due to day length. Um, and also the fact in the summer, they probably are spending more time, depending on where you live, um, outside, perhaps in the north anyway, we would have our animals outside in the sunshine and and I think um, just the natural, you know, being outside and all the sensory stimulation may mask or help with some of the signs that we would see if we're inside more. Absolutely. Um, the, um, okay. Is there a peer reviewed support? Is there for the diet showing 
um, signs of cognitive dysfunction for the diets you recommended? Is there, um, I guess, peer reviewed support? Yes. Okay, yes. we can send that too. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Um, awesome. We have a bunch of questions about asking about CBD. What do you think? <laughs> Uh, we need more research. Yeah, we don't, I don't know of any. There's one study looking at CBD for seizures, um, one for pain from Cornell mm -hmm. and one for noise phobia that was not very helpful. So it's still kind of the wild west with CBD. We, we just need more information. It may have potential applications, but as of yet, we don't um, have anything to confirm that. Of course, we tend to see the pets that's where CBD did not help by and large, not always, but I think if it was dramatically improving something, they might not come see me, but it's hard to say. So we may be a little biased, but um, yeah, hopefully we'll get more research down the road. Okay, great. Um, could one use Cosequin other supplements prophylactically? So before showing, showing signs. Oh, um, the Cosequin is more for a joint supplement to help with, um, you know, animals with, with degenerative joint disease, arth arthritis. Um, but using something like Cetolife or one of the prescription diets uh, certainly can start them. I recommend with, with my clients, once an animal is approaching the age of, um, depending on the, the size of the animal and its health status, but for instance, the age of 10, then we may want to consider switching over to a cognitive diet or trying one of the supplements. A lot of the, the some, well, I shouldn't say, it, we, we lack a lot of research for this disorder, but uh, some of it does show that the earlier we can treat, the better off we are in terms of slowing down that progression. And then, yeah, in terms of joint supplements, just from a general health perspective, um, th they don't reverse arthritis. So um, earlier is better if you're going to be giving it consistently because they can stop the progression. But once the arthritis is there, they're not going to turn back the clock. So um, those supplements are are better given. I mean, you don't have to start them when your dog is two, but better mm -hmm. a little bit um, proactively for sure. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, if your dog is circling, should you redirect them, stop them? Yeah, I think so. I think it depends. Well, I guess it depends on the reason that they're circling. So make sure you have some information about that because it could be something more serious. But um, if it's determined to be more related to behavioral changes, yeah, I usually do like a a redirecting and try to engage them in something else to stop it. Because I think if they're really repetitive, I mean, that can put wear and tear on their body and things like that. I don't know um, that there's a there's a general recommendation about that. What do you think, Dr. Berry? Yeah, I, I I don't know if there is a, a general recommendation, but I usually try to just calmly redirect them. I don't want to like physically <laughs> restrain them unless they are injuring themselves, but um, you know, often coaxing them with a treat or something and trying to get them interested in doing something else. I, I use the analogy changing the channel in the brain. So we'd want to get them focused on something else where rather than whatever was seeming to disorient them they now um, have something a little bit more purposeful to focus on. And I believe in the link for the video that uh, we had at the end of the presentation, there's uh, one section where the dog is stuck under a chair and she does use treats to, rather than just removing the dog from underneath the chair, she coaxes the dog out using a treat. And you know, so making it a little bit um, less hands-on because that, again, for an animal that's disoriented, can be uh, cause more anxiety and stress. Okay. Um, and similarly, how do you comfort your dog when they have an episode of panting from cognitive dysfunction? Dr. Anderson? Um, I get, yeah, I guess we need to, I mean, they could be panting for multiple reasons. Like they could be because they're hot. It could be because they're pain. So um Panting can be a sign of anxiety for sure, but it can also be a sign of many other things. So, um, but if it's a sign of anxiety or related to cognitive dysfunction, then I think some of the things that Dr. Perry talks about with it, like enrichment and giving them, um, you know, a chance, like 
cultivating like a, a safe environment where they have soft bedding and everything they need kind of nearby so that they're not sort of um, anxious about where to go and things like that. I think all of those things can help the consistency routine, all of that. Great. Thanks. Um, okay. So we have a question about incontinence, which, which we did cover, but is it that the dog is just forgetting to go? And could that be possible? Yes. Yeah, so it's not actually incontinence. I mean, it could, mm -hmm. could be, because I think, um, you know, with people too, our, our muscles, our sphincters maybe aren't as strong as they once were, yeah. but spayed female dogs can have incontinence due to hormonal change at the time of spaying. And that's different. They'll be asleep and they'll leak urine. Um, with cognitive dysfunction, I think it's usually in my experience that they are actually posturing to eliminate. It's just forgetting where they're supposed to go with like their house train, but then they don't remember to go when they're outside. Um, so it's not usually so much incontinence that we see like with other disorders. Okay, great. Um, and then we have a question is the, the, when this happens at night, is it equivalent to sundowners in humans? I don't have a good, I've been yeah. asked that question before I tried to research it and I don't, we, I know there's circadian rhythm in terms of like neurotransmitters and stress hormone. And so I want, I do have dogs where I've suspected something like that, but we don't diagnose or call anything sundowners that's similar okay, yeah. could potentially be, a, it's very, so dogs are a really good model for Alzheimer's in people. So I think there's probably very likely that there's some similarities like that, but I don't know. Do you have a better answer, Dr. Perry? Um, not not really, just uh, I do have clients who do report that the symptoms do seem to be worse in the evenings. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, with the, they're not really sure why it occurs in humans, whether it's accumulation of all this stimuli and input, sensory input during the day that then, um, you know, by the, the end of the day, they're becoming more anxious, or if it's more related to the fact that the um, uh, day length and the sun going down but it is reported we just haven't really researched it and to you know call it sundowner syndrome in animals but they do so some animals do show similar um worsening of these cognitive signs or worsening anxiety in the evenings great um let's see I think we're getting through them now. Yeah, lots of good ones, but um, do senior cats sometimes become aggressive toward their feline housemates or their owners? Any uh, yeah, they certainly can. It um, it's not one of the more commonly reported um, changes. I see more that the senior cat can become the victim of mm -hmm. aggression from younger cats. And also in, in dogs as well, they they don't uh, respond to because they may not perceive or be aware of signal social signals they are getting from other animals, and so if they're not responding to them appropriately, then the other animal may escalate and become aggressive towards them. But um, certainly, with any of these behavioral changes, aggression can be on that list. And I have seen dogs with cognitive dysfunction syndrome show aggression towards their owners or towards other animals in the house. Um, and often, you know, it, it's it's not typical of what we see in younger dogs, but it's certainly a, a possibility. Okay, great. Um, okay. And we're going to end on this one. Um, my 16 year old miniature pincher was diagnosed with cognitive dysfunction two years ago. We we're working with a veterinary behaviorist, have tried various medications. My dog still paces a lot. And she said, I think the pacing bothers me more than it does my dog. Um, should I just, uh, she doesn't appear to be agitated. Should I not worry about the pacing? And maybe that kind of sums it up and a lot, some of it anyway, that I guess it, it is being, being patient, right? And yeah with that but yeah can you just talk a little bit about that yeah I think I think it's hard it's yeah it's hard to I guess I guess I would keep an eye on it and see um especially if you're working with a veterinary behavior see if they have any suggestions for ways that you could redirect to other behaviors or engage them in something um I guess it depends also if your pet you know has mobility issues that 
maybe or or being taxed by pacing but um yeah i think i think it's it's important to recognize that your stress is not helping your pet <laughs> so you do kind of mm -hmm. have to let a little bit go and realize you're doing the best you can and and not you know it's a normal to feel guilty or stressed and and um and i think to you that you said two years right diagnosed that's good mm -hmm. uh, so yeah you're doing you're doing a lot of wonderful things for your pet Okay, I just want um, to comment on this. There are many people asking about medication, which we're not going to get into here. But if you, there are medications, obviously speak with your veterinarian about that. Um, and thank you very much. I, everyone is saying how wonderful and supportive it was. And we really appreciate your time. Um, thank you again for, for joining us. Thank you to Kimberly Young for doing such a wonderful job organizing this event and all of our events. And again, thank you, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Perry for sharing your time and expertise. Um, and a very special thanks to all of you for um, joining us tonight. Um, and we will see you next time. Thanks again. Good night, everyone. Thank you, thank you all. Okay.